Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to start this with a brief introduction. My name's Susan Kiefer. I'm a Center for Advanced Studies professor of geology. And we're running an initiative on campus all year called Mega Disasters. Um, the purpose of this initiative is to raise the awareness and hopefully the activity on campus about uh, real natural catastrophes such as Katrina or the Sumatran earthquake, which we had some forums on last year, and what we're calling stealth mega disasters, which are the um, potential disasters that are facing us in the future, but they have a slower onset time than the natural disasters such as hurricanes. And we're using the natural disasters as kind of hooks to get people interested in this. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested in this theme in general, to either get hold of me, um, I have some business cards with me, or if you can remember to log on to the Center for Advanced Studies, you can find out about this, because not all of the work that we're doing is clumped under one format, say through the Center for Advanced Study. And today is actually a really good example. We had the pleasure of learning that Susanna Hecht was going to be in town. Um, and so we arranged with the Center for Global Studies to sponsor her visit, and it's actually been advertised through there. So uh, this is kind of like an octopus, this initiative on mega disasters, reaching out and grabbing people who get involved with us. And we'd like to spread the word as much as we can about what we're doing and get people involved. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ed Collage, who's going to introduce Susanna Hecht. Yeah, thank you very much, Sue. Uh, uh, let me welcome you to the first of a series of three uh, uh, lectures that will be given in the academic year in the fall um, on uh, mega disasters. Uh, today, uh, I'll come to our speaker's topic in a moment. But on October 10th, if you want to mark your calendar, or in, and November 28th, we will have two other um, uh, distinguished speakers. One, uh, our own Robert McKim, who will be talking about, uh, can the major religious traditions help us to solve our global environmental problems? That's on. Uh, October 10, uh, a different venue than this one, uh, but they'll be on the, uh, uh, our own Center for Global Studies uh, uh, website. And the uh, third talk is on November 29th to, uh, at four o'clock here at Spurlock, and it's by um, uh, Peter Hunkton, uh, and he'll be talking about Chairman Mao, the Great Leap Forward, Ecological Disasters in South China. Now let's turn to our uh, uh, presentation for today. And uh, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Susanna Hecht, a professor of urban planning at UCLA, um, who will be speaking to us on globalization, forest trends, and received ideas, rethinking development and conservation in the 21st century. Um, professor uh, Hecht received her PhD in geography from the University of California at Berkeley. And since that, thing, uh, that time, she's been extremely active in a whole host of uh, activities. Um, and I can uh, tell you that we would be here for a half hour if I had to catalog all of them. In terms of her recognitions, uh, she is presently at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton University. Uh, she was uh, on, uh, uh, acknowledged uh, and received the Sheldon Colton Davis Fellowship uh, at Princeton in 2003. Um, and she's also enjoyed being a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Um, let me just sketch quickly uh, some of her uh, varied uh, and impressive activities in, over the last 20 years. She's focused on the political economy of tropical development, its environmental and social impacts, and alternatives to current patterns of destruction. And uh, these interests range from policy transformation to the concrete and technical implications of indigenous knowledge systems, local land use strategies in peasant economies, and the dynamics of timber and non-timber forest extraction in top, uh, tropical zones. Um, among her uh, recognitions and prestigious grants are those from the MacArthur Foundation, 
Pew Charitable Trust, J.C. Smith Noise, and the National Science Foundation. And I have a list of about 14 or so lines more to go, and I'll just skip over those to at least identify some of her major publications. In 1990, uh, she published the work Fate of a Forest, which uh, was recognized among the top 10 uh, works in the area of cultural geography. She has uh, in press already the Amazon Odyssey, The Lost Paradise of Euclides de Cuna. She's preparing yet another book, Amazon's End Globalization, Global Change and Tra Tropical Transformation. And uh, with uh, Susan Candle, uh, she's uh, completed a work for the National Academy of Sciences, The Fundamental Role of Science and Technology in International Development. Um, this stream of recognitions, accomplishments, uh, certainly establishes her credentials to, to speak to the topic today, which is globalization, forest trends, and received ideas, rethinking development and conservation in the 21st century. She'll speak for 40 to 50 minutes, followed by discussion and questions. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Susanna Hecht. Hi, I'm delighted to be here. I, this is so techno what you have planned here, so I have to like sort of get booted up here, so hang on for a second uh, while I attach myself, as they say. Uh, let's see, and it turns on and everything. It's so, it's so modern. So let me, um, let me go ahead. All right, well, anyway, I'm delighted to be here. It's terrific to uh, reconnect and have reunions with family and old friends, and so I'm uh, uh, especially pleased to find myself here. Um, I'm also interested because in many ways, as I was driving uh, from California uh, along, I, I was sort of thinking as I passed soybean fields about, of course, the relationship of Illinois and American soybeans to another soybean zone that I happen to spend a certain amount of time in. And also, as you drive across the United States, one of the things that is the surface, that is, if you look at where are the big carbon sinks in the world, one of the most important ones are the northeast and southeast of the United States, areas that had historically been very important parts of the agricultural frontier, but which now um, are graced with leafy forests, perhaps not everybody's favorite type of forest, but in any case, um, they are uh, currently under forest cover. So what I'm going to do today is a couple of things, uh, not the least of which is talk very quickly, because I have to sort of cover two large narratives, but I think they're very interesting because they represent uh, two sort of counter uh, experiences of processes of globalization. And one of the things, one of the reasons I'm doing this is one, there is a sort of general story about globalization as massively destructive, and it comes from, in many cases, uh, the sort of Indonesian experience of deforest, you know, sort of rampant deforestation and so on. But there are also another series of dynamics that goes on in these, in, in these processes of, uh, let's say, environmental change, sharp, rapid, forceful deforestation that merit rethinking because they throw into question a lot of the received ideas about how you control deforestation. The other thing is that um, there's another counter story in, or a sort of less well known, but perhaps equally significant story in globalization and tropical forests, which is the story of forest resurgence. And the dynamics of that are also extremely interesting. They are changed by localities in very complex ways. And also, of course, they're interesting because they certainly relate to the state I live in most of the time, which is California, because, which has, of course, a, a large immigrant population, particularly from El Salvador, and also because the United States in general has a large um, Central American population. And perhaps uh, these questions of labor flow, migration, international migration and remittances actually end up being a sort of interesting other story about globalization and forest change. So these kinds of things, um, uh, the, these dynamics of globalization naturally are sort of mediated by localities, 
But the thing that's important about them is to really kind of understand what the implications of these kinds of things might be for rethinking how does, how do economics work in terms of transforming uh, tropical landscapes, an, an issue of importance to all of us for reasons of global climate change, carbon absorption, biodiversity, hydrology, there's a whole range of things, social equity, there are lots of questions we can ask about why it is that they work. So there are these questions about how, does, how do these global processes unfold? What's their meaning in global planetary terms? And again, this is still a cipher, as they say, scientists are still working out the problems. And then also, if we're going to think about conservation, if we think these environments are important and interesting, then the question really becomes, how, what does globalization mean in the context of these new dynamics? And um, so in that sense, I want to, what I'm going to do is sort of give you some uh, images about the dynamics of deforestation, and then I'm going to do a sort of comparison about how these things go. What I'd also uh, ask you to think about, too, would be the question of also what is a forest? Because one of the problems that we have if we work in communities or in anthropogenic landscapes is that even people don't think that there are forests there. Uh, as the distinguished John, uh, ecologist John Turborg once said about El Salvador, their nature has been extinguished. And uh, when I went to do some research there for several months, um, I, as I was picked up at the airport by someone from the Ministry of Environment, they said, well, you know, we don't have any forests here. And we, you know, so I was like prepared for this life and landscape, nothing, you know, perhaps a scraggly little tree with a meager and emaciated cow underneath, the sort of African Sahelian version of Latin America. And instead I was going through these lush forests, which apparently were invisible to my, con uh, my conrad, uh, comrades. So it was one of these things, which is that anthropogenic forests, for whatever reason, have been sort of downgraded in the conservation story. And in a sense, what I want to do is also to reanimate this question for you, because what's happened is that forests in the conservation ideology of the 20th century were sort of imbued with a kind of Muirist fantasy of the forest primeval. Of course, Muir, of course, even as the Miwok were dragging out, was reciting Byron about some kind of romantic forest primeval sitting there, untrammeled by the hand of man, uh, even as I say the Miwok were limping at their way out. But there has been in the sort of scientific literature and the sort of popular literature the idea that the only true forests are these giant tropical rainforests. And so everything else sort of doesn't count. Well, while everyone was having a, uh, having a busy bit about deforestation of large bi high biomass forests, extensive areas were being cleared of open savannas, of tropical deciduous forests, and tropical dry forests. Indeed, these forests were ravaged from one end of the continent to the other. And partly because they didn't, they weren't these sort of sacred forests, but rather a kind of a sacrifice of them. So we have this model of sort of forests worth preserving, forests that don't count, and then the sort of anthropogenic forests, the urban forests, forests that are created by human agriculture, human intervention, which seem to be almost completely invisible. So what I'm going to try to do in this talk also is talk a little bit about that, because we have sort of the idea of the primeval forest, the ecological hotspot, as those of you who follow ecology, uh, conservation ecology will know. And then we have those precious forest fragments, and then we have, of course, the matrices. So in a certain sense, this is like recharging the matrix um, and bringing the matrix up as a means and as the central place for conservation in the next century. Now, I have been taught how to do something really great. Watch this. So uh, if those of you who uh, know me know that I'm normally quite um, uh, nerve-wracked about these things, but I was coached and trained very beautifully by the um, the, uh, the technician here, so now I'm going to like wreak confidence and 
accountability. Well, so what I'm going to talk to you about today in this sort of, in this case study, is uh, the set of case studies is really I'm going to compare Bolivia and uh, El Salvador. Now, of course, there's a certain convenience to that, which is I study those places. But, um, so naturally, it's more convenient for me to talk about these than other places. But on the other hand, um, there are some sort of unusual similarities. And the other thing is that if we look at how the, if we sort of go from the standard received ideas, what you would expect is a sort of completely different landscape outcome from what you get. El Salvador, of course, is considered, uh, oh, I don't know, the poster child for environment, Malthusian degradation, high levels of population, sort of like a Haiti kind of scene. And then, uh, you know, it's mestizoized, no indigenous people. Well, it's theoretically, um, it's densely populated, 200 people per kilometer squared, that kind of thing. And then you have Bolivia sitting there the size of France, same level of population, um, and 85% native. So, of course, in this sort of essentializing of indigenous populations that is so popular, we would expect some kind of more um, uh, uh, integration and uh, environmental care that would naturally come as a function of that population. Now, they're also um, involved in bunches of other things. Both have been, uh, have had, uh, have participated in wars which had different kinds of impacts. The civil wars of Central America in El Salvador had an enormous impact on the environment, on the, on the landscape and the environment, not to mention on, with, on the population. Um, Bolivia, on the other hand, was the site of a major, how do we say, war on drugs. Now, in, they're both kind of different in terms of the impact of war. In the case of El Salvador, the, the war stopped the agricultural frontier. I'll talk about that more later. In the case of Bolivia, the war on drugs actually pushed the agricultural frontier into more remote areas. And also, um, uh, because it, it uses defoliants, actually resulted in more deforestation. So you have a kind of contradictory dynamic, one, one sort of war experience producing uh, forest, uh, uh, a, a, a forest recovery, the other expanding the, the forest and uh, deforestation frontier. Um, <clears throat> historically, both of them are linked to, have been linked to an export economy, um, so they've been globalized or into global commodity circuits for quite some time. Their social indicators are both pretty low. They're largely rural populations. Um, they have amongst the lowest rural, uh, rural wages. But historically, these have also been revolutionary places. There was a revolution in Bolivia in 1952, and many argue that um, the FMLN, in fact, did win the Civil War, uh, which ended in 1992. Um, they both shifted from sort of authoritarian to at least nominally democratic states. They were takers in terms of structural adjustment policies and strategies otherwise known as the Washington Consensus. Um, they also had the emergence of environmental institutions about the same time. The ministries of environment for both were basically implemented in 1996. So even though they seem uh, wildly different, they sort of are the same as sort of experimental sites. So the question is, um, how do we really, what, what's going on in each of these? And since they are sort of structurally, in many ways, they're sort of surprisingly structurally similar, where they diverge is where you would expect to see a different landscape. If you're working off of the 20th century ideas of Malthusianism, you would naturally expect to see the worst deforestation in uh, uh, in El Salvador and the glorious tropical forest gracing the landscapes of um, Bolivia. In fact, you find just the opposite. So let me go on to my next slide. Um, this doesn't show very well, but this is basically, um, I'm just going to be taking you to this area, twisting you through space and time into the um, main expansion zone in the Bolivian Amazon, which is the Frontier. You might more or less think of this as the frontier of, of, of the Brazilian, an extension of the Brazilian frontier. But I'd like you to pay attention to is this um, this river. I think this is what we have here is 
I was driving and I practically screeched over when I saw the Mennonite church. Okay, um, so we have this extraordinary dynamic of really rapid and as I say, almost unparalleled uh, deforestation occurring. So we are now, so we have, which is sort of surprising given if we were working off of the model that um, uh, 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 the Malthusian models that have so infused our understanding of deforestation in the tropics. Um, but now we go to El Salvador, and this gives you a sort of sense of the three dimensions of this place. Um, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's organic, and also this is, this is an accurate representation of its vegetation. Now, given that it has a high population density, what this, these slides show you is simply that after the war, uh, 1992, what you had was this situation. All that red stuff is pretty much bare ground um, uh, or very, very lightly vegetated landscapes, agricultural landscapes. What you have uh, then here in, um, in this period, 2001, uh, basically, is this extraordinary shift away from uh, a landscape with quite a bit of deforestation into one with quite a bit of forest recovery. We have, uh, this work, by the way, is carried out, uh, I should have said this earlier, is carried out in conjunction with a um, uh, uh, Sasan Sachi from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and also with uh, an NGO in uh, El Salvador called Prisma. Well, anyway, what you can see, we, uh, if you start to look at the shift from bare ground to covered, what you begin to see is a sort of decline in, their, in areas that are bare or poorly, poorly, poorly covered. And then an expansion into areas, as you can see, that increasingly become more forested. So we begin to see an extraordinary increase in forest cover. From this, from this set of data, what you get is something that approaches close to 60% forest recovery. In a later paper, we basically take out these lower signals because they're kind of noisy. But, um, and, and, um, uh, but if we were going to look at the rate of recovery at the highest, the most dense woody forest re recovery, what you would see in, is about um, uh, a recovery rate of about 22% of the landscape has improved its forest cover since 1992. So that's pretty quick to recover a landscape. So now, uh, and, and it's surprising because the population is so dense. So I'll go back to that in a minute um, and about why that occurs. But right now I'm going to go, I'm going to take you forward into, back into the question of deforestation and soybeans in, um, in, in Bolivia. One of the things that, uh, one of the really, again, the sort of Malthusian um, story always has it that, well, you know, you have these peasant farmers who are going and ripping up the agricultural frontier. What we find, however, is that if we look at the evolution of soybean production, what we find is the expansion of industrial and agriculture. Now, that in itself is uh, a sort of interesting thing. Um, what is also interesting about it is one of the main things that was used to explain why there was so much deforestation in other periods was they kept saying, well, you know, those lousy cattle ranches, if they only did more intensive agriculture, then deforestation would slow. What you have going on in this is actually a dynamic that is quite un unprecedented. 
in the, the sort of literature and discussions of tropical deforestation, which is the rise of hyper-intensive agriculture, which is driven by markets in a lot of ways into an extraordinary deforestation dynamic, such as the slides I showed you a minute ago. Well, why, why is this occurring? Well, in part, there's been a huge, one of the dimensions of global change is the shift of the, uh, the movement of technology from places to place, um, which is extremely important. And one of the, there are key reasons this had to move in using, resolving very serious constraints, soil constraints, uh, adaptation to aluminum, aluminum, phosphorus, and low levels of micronutrients. They had to deal with the question of daylight. They had to deal with a whole panoply of pests that didn't occur elsewhere. And also, there were the problems of shifting from a relatively small-scale sector that had existed in southern Brazil into a really large um, agro-industrial structure. The second, of course, uh, is that a lot of this is driven not just by technology, but by the expansion of markets in China. China buys now about a third of its uh, soybeans from Brazil and Bolivia. It's part, you can sort of see this as part of a uniform um, uh, economy in a lot of ways. Um, so it's being driven by uh, this extraordinary international market pressure. Um, the other thing is that not only do you have a change in the um, uh, industrial agricultural sector, but you also have a change in the livestock sectors in terms of increasing the amounts of areas that are devoted to confined animal production for chicken and stuff and pigs, as well as for livestock. So, uh, and that livestock is not trivial. This is, we're talking about something like 30 million animals. Brazil probably is the largest livestock exporter on the planet at this time. It's certainly the number two, perhaps this year number one, uh, soybean exporter in the world. There are also institutional factors, credit, the tenures were secure, and so on. And also, there has been expansion of the transport system, and much more is planned, the dreaded Avanza Brazil, which is estimated to probably undermine something like 40% of the remaining Brazilian ports. Um, this um, is, a, is a, a slide, basically, about the movement of capital and where it comes from. And what you can see here is that if we start in 1990, when this stuff really begins, you have the Japanese and the Bolivians uh, working in their, toiling in their gardens. And then, of course, there's the influence of Mennonites and so on. But as this sort of evolves over time, what begins to happen is, as you can see, the Brazilians begin to take over more and more area. The Mennonites drop in their power. The, the Japanese move in. And then also you have an array of other groups like Canadians, the Finns, um, Russians, Ukrainians, all move into the sector. So what you see is uh, an internationalization, not only of the technology, not only of the market globalization, not only of the markets, but also of the capital and the actual producers. So this is an extraordinarily internationalized landscape. So let's go back to this sort of lovely story of the forest recovery um, and how do we explain that. So what you see in that, the, the soybean case, just to take you back, is really the dynamics of, a, of one variety of deforestation linked to technology, markets, and large-scale international capital and very dynamic markets, as we said. In the case here, uh, what we're looking at is something rather different. Okay, for the first, uh, the, the one thing, of course, and one should never uh, underestimate the impacts of wars. Uh, at lunch today, we were all sort of going, well, we were all sort of musing about the, um, the impacts of wars and how in many ways it was rather good for the environment, not that one would recommend that as a policy, but um, that what it does is it really stops, it makes rural areas very insecure, and stops agricultural frontiers, whether they're large-scale producers or small ones. And so the result of this was simply that basically people fled. They fled to cities, they fled out of the country, and this was to have extraordinary impacts in the longer, uh, the longer story. So you, it had an impact on the agricultural frontier, it had an impact on migration, and of course, the questions of agrarian reform. Um, 
Also, there's a number of other things. I mentioned this earlier, that there was the, there was the, um, uh, um, uh, they were sort of takers on neoliberal reforms of various kinds, uh, and in terms of trade, especially trade liberalization, and structural adjustment, and local and regional environmental politics. But let me go forward with this. The reason I put this up is because the history of the narrative about El Salvador is so strongly about population density and environmental destruction that it sort of obliterates anybody's ability to actually look at what's going on. The reason this is up here is because it can sort of, what you can see is that in many areas, the rural population density has remained the same from its most intense period of deforestation at the end of the 1970s, and it's just as dense now as it was then. So you have these kinds of things here, um, but particularly up here, this is the sort of mountainous zone, this is the FL FMLN strongholds. So these areas did not, if you follow the literature on what's called the forest transition, which talks about how forests in Europe and the United States uh, emerged after everybody left the countryside, went to the cities, um, and basically abandoned such lands. What you have here is not a story of land abandonment. The population density is still very high, but you do have forest resurgence occurring at the same time. The next, this slide basically uh, really is meant to address another element Globalization. If we were talking about um, before the movement of large scale capital and in large scale international industrial and even corporate capital, what we're talking about here in El Salvador right now is, if you will, um, international finance from below. Uh, if you think about uh, migration, most of these, most of the Salvadorian immigrants and most of the Central American immigrants go to the United States. Uh, and they basically sent back money. And the result of this in the case of El Salvador is that something like 66% of the foreign exchange is in fact derived from remittances. This is an extraordinary amount of shift. And it's really what you see here are the dynamics of uh, structural change. I, I would get a crick in my neck if I look at that, so I'm going to look at it again. The way you can see is really from a, a, a rather dramatic displacement of traditional agro-exports and so on, um, and non-traditional exports, to uh, uh, essentially a remittance-based economy. So we're looking at an extraordinary structural change in terms of how that economy functions, um, which is something that El Salvador, as I mentioned, I think, um, about if you were to take all the remittances from all over the world and turn them into a country, you know, the Filipinos working in Doha or, you know, these Sri Lankans in Saudi Arabia or people working um, in, from moving to Kofi Bar, wage labor, they're all sending money back. And if you were to sort of jump those all together into one economy, they would be the 25th largest economy on the planet. So the question of remittances, though we are looking at a fairly interesting and perhaps an extreme case, is one that actually merits rethinking in terms of globalization, if you will, from below, and its impact on the environment. So let's see. Um, here is the um, distribution of these things. Oops, sorry, let me go back. So here we have the, I, I love this, so I can just do that. So I'm uh, here we have basically the various provinces or counties of El Salvador, um, and below here we have all of the, the number of households that get remittances um, and uh, the proportion of households and the amount. Now, again, one of the things we began to test for is to say, well, what about this building scene stuff? Because after all, it is one of these things that comes up time and time again in the environmental literature. So we did a bunch of correlations between forest cover and population density, and we found no relations. But what we did find was a rather interesting correlation, which is as the percentage of households go up uh, 
in terms of their remittances, um, and also, uh, um, let's see, the, the percentage of what I can um, the, this on my own slide here. Um, what you see is a, as an increase in, and as this, this is the access of area, this is the access of numbers of households. What you find is that as you have more households receiving remittances, you have less forest clearing because forest, you know, there is some clearing going on, and much more forest resurgence at quite statistically significant levels. So one of the things that this shows you is that the role of remittances is very highly correlated with both a decline in deforestation and with a um, rise in, um, in forest resurgence. Now, there are lots of reasons for this. And let me go forward a little bit on this to give you a review of it. Oh, I just wanted to, with this basically, as I was saying, the question of remittances is by no means limited to El Salvador. El Salvador is great because it's so small and the data is so good. But what you can see from this is that the role of remittances is rather extensive. Sorry. Um, it has a, uh, a very, uh, it, it exceeds by orders of magnitude direct foreign investment. So you could imagine the little hundred dollars that are being sent by um, various migrants are actually exceeding what were supposed to be the engines of growth, which was for corporate investment. You can see also that they are often an extremely large proportion of the GDP. Um, Nicaragua is a third, over a third. So, and this gives you sort of the amount of migration that in fact occurs, and this is the volume in terms of uh, millions of dollars. But the point is that it's not surprising if you look at Central America as a whole that you're beginning to see a much broader dynamic of foreign resurgence than you might have expected to see, particularly given the, um, the sort of seminal role that this has had in the discourses of Malthusian uh, disasters. Another element, too, uh, besides war and uh, remittances, was also that the reason of what was the war about, it was about agrarian reform. So you had a very deep agrarian reform, quite different from the agrarian reform that occurred. I, I, I purposely did not go into the agrarian reform in Bolivia. We've also occurred at the same time because I did it all night. But in any case, one of the things that you see here with this is that it was a very deep agrarian reform. It was a, a, an agrarian reform that had also important gender implications. About 30% of the people who got land were women. Um, it, it permitted a variety of new tenurial forms. That is, it wasn't just private property regimes. It was collective ownership. It was co-management stuff. There were private plots. A, a, a great, uh, a, heterogen a great heterogeneity in the forms of tenurial regimes. Um, the effect of the deep agrarian reform was that lots of people got small pieces of land. What this means is that there's a stickiness to the landscape that is unlike the soy thing where someone says, okay, um, Hernando, let's go and clear a thousand hectares this, this year. No one can clear a thousand hectares because it's all in these little pieces and people have different things that they're doing with them, not the least of which is that it, a certain amount of self-provisioning um, as well as uh, 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 investment in housing and things like that. But the point is that you're not seeing the kind of uh, large-scale landscape modification over very short periods of time as you see on the southern months of the Amazon. The other thing is, of course, a lot of these systems are multi-use. That is, they are for both shade, fodder, food, uh, coffee production, and so on. They, they're low capital uh, systems. They don't require very much capital at all. So there isn't that much investment in them. And of course, the agrarian reform was essentially targeted at the peasant system, partly as a result of political, um, um, political mediation. It was a condition of the peace accords. Um, and also, during the war, the elites had been weaned away from agriculture and simply decided it was rather more interesting for them to enter into financial services rather than uh, worry about their uh, taking on this decline in the sector. 
So you can see that this is really a sort of poverty alleviation agrarian reform rather than the productive or capitalist agrarian reform. Well, so what are the other things to take you back to this other slide that I just showed you a minute ago? Um, we have, I've sort of gone through the implications of the war uh, and migration and agrarian reform for you, but one of the things about structural adjustment um, was the tree, free trade policies and also a sort of larger dynamic within global economies that simply produced a real collapse in the traditional grain or traditional agriculture that you see in much of the third world. So compared to uh, uh, 1970, the, the uh, early 21st century uh, uh, peasant farmer was getting about 27% of what they got in, in real terms in 1970. So the small-scale sector has been enormously undermined by a combination of cheap food policies, a lack of subsidies that was part of the uh, structural adjustment reforms, and this essentially a, uh, has been part of the, the urban strategy um, for development that's characterized most Latin American countries. So what you're seeing is a real erosion of food prices such that the cost of production for a peasant household end up being more costly than the, what you can purchase these grains for. And of course, there's always a debate about whether there's dumping and uh, so on. But industrialized grains have basically been very instrumental in undermining the peasant sector. The next thing, of course, is like, let's say you were going for coffee, why are they already buy? As uh, Beth could tell you, since she's been like crying, me, it's been her her job to keep me, you know, my blood caffeine level up to its appropriate thing. But you know, this is the kind of thing you just hate to see if you're a coffee producer. Look at how volatile the sector is, and it's also a downfall sector. Well, there's you know the reasons why. One, there's tons of coffee in the world. Every development program that was ever put in by the World Bank or any inter-American bank or anybody, all this was sort of based on having small, coffee's a terrific smallholder crop. Also, huge areas like tons of Amazonia, Rondonia, and so on, went into coffee. So uh, Vietnam went into coffee. A lot of that sort of Central Asian plateau went into coffee. So what you have is, even though demand for coffee has been extreme, the market itself is phenomenally volatile. And also, the, the, the returns to it are um, are open to question. It's a downward trend. Although it's fun for us on one level, uh, I don't. I haven't noticed my cup of coffee going down in price. It's a constant thing. For us. Those who deal with the coffee sector always are upset about that their coffee never gets cheaper. Okay. Well, one of these things is let's go into more of a a, a comparison between us. I think what you can see now is that. There's a sort of confluence of things that's driving both the increase and in both uh, in deforestation and also the increase in forest growth. And in a certain sense, it's useful to go and look at the political economy of natural resources. One of the key elements is what do the elites think about it and what are they doing about it? And what's the role of natural resources in the economy? Well, as you can see, El Salvador is about 12 percent, while Bolivia is 60 percent. The elites basically in El Salvador have said, you know, I'd rather be in urban finance. Um, and, uh, you know, why should I even bother with this declining sector? But in Bolivia, the elites, the agro-industrial elites, are the key and driving sector. So, in essence, the role of natural resources there, like in Brazil, where 30 percent of the GDP is derived from agricultural exports, the natural resource sector starts to become an extremely important one in terms of the larger national development trajectory. In terms of the agrarian reform, I think I've sort of made the argument that in the case of the El Salvadorian one, you really did have a truly redistributive agrarian reform. That is, it really went to a lot of people, and lots of lots of lands were expropriated, and the state put in a lot of lands. In the case of the Bolivian agrarian reform, essentially it was a way to um, transfer what had been state ownership of um, land 
into private property regimes um, for, uh, to, to make sure that uh, overlapping rights wouldn't occur. And um, this, of course, became a, the dynamic of a kind of accumulated form, what's called in these studies the Junker Road, basically modernizing large estates. In terms of the poverty buffers in each of these, you have basically the role of international migration, you have the COVID economy, you have the informal economy, and um, of course crime in all, in all cases. But what you really have in uh, Bolivia that is sort of the buffer of, for the poor is the COVID economy. In El Salvador, you have international and the remittance economy. So the key um, agri agricultural policies are cheap food policies in both cases. But the real difference has to do with where the elites place themselves. And so in the case of El Salvador, there's almost no rural credit. There's a little credit for coffee, but nothing I mean, you could sneeze at. It's about 2% of the total uh, credit. Whereas in Bolivia, it's a key credit sector. So th this is where most of the investment is being stimulated. So the, looking at how globalization works, I think you can see there's sort of a contrasting dynamic that's unfolding. Um, they are very different places. The other thing is to look at the nature of the commodities themselves. Um, coffee, of course, is a tree crop. It's grown in, often in agroforestry systems. It's, uh, it's, it can be quite diverse. The, system, the systems themselves can be uh, often in, as, as diverse in terms of its biota, particularly in terms of its animal biota, as tropical forest areas. Um, you may have been hearing about biodiversity-friendly coffee so that the migrant birds that we enjoy in the summer here are luxuriating in delicious coffee forests in Central America, and this is why we should buy really great coffee. And uh, from these forests, a position I strongly uh, support. But um, what you have on one side is an agroforestry system versus, in Bolivia, an agroindustrial one. Well, coffee is a relatively highly labor-absorbing system. The soy uh, agro-industrial one is not. So the system that I showed you um, is one that's, in, that's characterized by relatively few owners, relatively little employment. It's got a labor aristocracy because it involves the use of very high technology machinery, a lot of computers and so on, and very sophisticated timing. The technologies um, that are associated with it, of course, are um, hybrid technologies and you know, indigenous technologies and some modern technologies when we come to coffee, but basically a high-tech agro-industrial technology system as we go into Bolivia. What's interesting is also that the way the capital works in these two commodities is different. Obviously, a perennial system will have some capital. Those trees are sitting there, and it's hard to flip them. And if you flip them, it's not clear when you can, what you can get back to so quickly. Whereas with soybean, and soy is really a rotational crop with, as it is here, with corn, with sorghum, and with sunflowers. And um, of course, what you could do is you, you flip it all the time in response to other kinds of market opportunities. The um, products, coffee really um, basically is, there are some ancillary, essentially non-marketed products, firewood, uh, artisanal materials that come out of those coffee forests, and of course, the, the birds and so on, which have their touristic virtues. But soy, as you know, is, can be turned into anything. It, you know, it's kind of like, um, uh, uh, it can, a, a shmoo or something. It can be turned into a substitute for meat. It can be turned into a substitute for paint. It can be turned into a substitute for ink. It can be turned into uh, a substitute for oil. So um, it has uh, uh, a range of end products, whereas coffee pretty much, well, there's the stuff you get off the beans, and there are the grounds, you know, but pretty much what you get at the end is coffee. So it's that lack of diversity, the lack of flexibility and the lack of diversity give it a very different kind of dynamic. So when you start to intensify it, um, what, do, what do you get? Well, if you intensify uh, 
uh, coffee cultivation, basically you end up getting sort of more forest. You don't get less forest. If you end up intensifying your production of soybeans, for the most part, you get more deforestation. Well, I'm going to sort of move to the end here because we're sort of getting, uh, we're going on in time here. So let me, um, actually, I think I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into the dark uh, and turn that on in a minute. So what I'd like to do now is sort of talk a little bit about, finally, what does, what does this all mean? Um, well, first of all, there's a really different context for understanding conservation and deforestation that actually I think still is, uh, the way it's being understood is still really rather incipient. One is that the sort of models for understanding both deforestation and its alternatives really don't make sense. They're not logical in terms of the modern situation. That is, the, the Malthusian models of deforestation, the internal policy, the distorted policy story that was so much of the late 20th century, neither of those are really explanatory paradigms, even though they still have a certain power in um, conservation discourses. The second thing, so there's the Malthusian story that doesn't seem to work. And also, if you look at what we're seeing as the alternatives to deforestation, the question of intensification of production and consolidation of um, simple uh, property regimes, capitalist property regimes where you own everything, and there's individual owner of every, ownership of everything, was supposed to actually reduce deforestation because during other periods, conflict over property rights was one means of clearing land to claim it and thus assert property rights, was how um, it drove a great deal of, of clearing in Central America and in Brazil. But in fact, those models don't work. In fact, almost the opposite seems to be the case, where intense, dense forests seem to be uh, associated with dense populations and areas with very clear and, and uh, uh, complex property regimes. And areas with clear property regimes and intensive production seem to be resulting in explosive deforestation. So um, one of the things that uh, we need to sort of think about this is also what these ha what are the implications these have um, in terms of conservation things and uh, conservation ideologies? One is the question of fragment ecology. Those of you who study conservation biology cannot have been unaware of the last 20 years of the rise in fr fragment ecology and island biogeography as the sort of modal idea of tropical hotspots, areas of high endemism uh, as, uh, and high species diversity and forest fragments as being key elements in understanding the dynamics of species extinction and loss. Essentially, this was based on a kind of metaphoric idea of an island in a sea of, a forest island in a sea of grass, or experimentally, a forest island in a sea of water. Um, so essentially, these models became, these metaphors and the models that came for them basically made the area around them and the way that the science itself was structured was structured in such a way as to make the areas around them highly depauperate compared to these various sizes of fragments and then extinction rates were calculated in each of these little forest islands. But as Lenin once said, theory is good, but it doesn't stop reality from existing. <clears throat> and so one of the things one might want to look at is the question of the matrices, that is the area between those forest fragments. And, there's a, and this is an area that has been highly understudied. Uh, there's some emerging research that's going on in these kinds of agrarian landscapes. But the point is that they're much more ecologically complex than people previously realized. So one thing is that the matrix itself may be the key point of, for conservation in the 20th century, 21st century. And these are, of course, areas that are most likely to be inhabited. That is, these are the areas that are most, also, most likely to be both habitat and artifact. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that um, endangered ecosystems are not collapsing as rapidly as you would imagine, 
because the matrices are more complex. So in a certain sense, what one has to imagine is a kind of a co-management or co-imagination of a larger landscape ecology that includes both, as they say, the wild and the tame. Indeed, mat matrices and naturalness may be uh, on a par with uh, generating some and supporting diversity at landscape level. So this needs to be um, really reviewed in more detail. The other thing is that in terms of the class of uh, the conservation questions, and I have much more to say on this, but I'm not going to do it uh, too much because we're running out of time and perhaps we can get to it through the questions, is that one, the Malthusian models really should not be used to, uh, uh, to such a degree. Second, um, as I mentioned, intensification can produce an explosive frontier. And so questions need to be thought about, about how you might structure these kinds of areas. Um, the other thing is that in terms of policies, areas that are really reproducing uh, forests and permitting forests to regenerate are what one might think of these days as landscape orphans. And so there's a whole series of questions that one might raise about these. First of all, uh, what are the kinds of policies that might enhance these? Well, if you look around, one of the things that seems to be emerging is a new kind of rurality, which is where rural producers see themselves less as producers of commodities and more as producers of, of services. And within these, there are the questions of landscape services, whether for water, for biodiversity maintenance, um, for carbon absorption, and uh, larger term uh, uh, climate mediation. So these kinds of questions, which range in scale from very local uh, mobilizations to the most lofty international treaties, are sort of one arena in which such things could occur. The second thing is that if one uh, looks, is, sees environmental services as being a key element in, as they say, recharging the matrix, um, it would be useful also to have some social transfers into these areas. That is, if we believe that um, environmental services are, as people say, equal to the sum of all the economic activity that is produced by all the economies of the world, then perhaps we need to put a little bit of value on the stewardship of this and say, well, if you, you can't ask people not to produce, to, to, do, to manage and to engage in these things for nothing, right now, after all, these uh, Salvadorian peasants uh, you know, working in Los Angeles are basically paying for forest resurgence in Central America. Another thing is the question of ecological zoning. While the dynamics of the soybean frontier is pretty exciting on one level, the question of its sustainability still remains open to question. So one of the, one of the issues one might like to think about in terms of this is how would you, uh, could zoning in fact keep it out of areas where it is unlikely to be sustainable over the long term? There are areas where with relatively good soils and relatively flat terrain that can tolerate this soybean as probably as well as anything. But there are areas where it can't, and it would be a shame to destroy a lot of uh, forest areas uh, if you were not going to um, uh, um, be able to uh, recuperate these landscapes. So the point really is to think about not, use, not just replacing the set-aside model, but rather to think about questions of how you complement these kinds of things and to also think about a, a discourse that would embrace many different types of forest. That is, not just a, a kind of a conservation ideology and representation that focuses on some kind of sacred grove uh, or looks at forests as a, that aren't those as a kind of sacrifice zone, which is the case of the southern Brazilian flank, or a, a kind of forest approach that views anthropogenic forests as essentially invisible and valueless. So in a certain sense, we have to look at the dynamics and globalization of processes, rethink the processes that drive deforestation, rethink the processes that, give, that promote forest recover, recovery, and also think about how we represent these forests. <clears throat> 
So by way of, um, of sort of uh, ending this, uh, by widening the divide between nature and culture, which has been the tradition in forest conservation in the 20th century, we may be risking it all. And there's huge potential for enhancing the values of everyday landscapes. And the first step really is getting them on the map and uh, seeing landscapes, both wild and tame, as deeply interacting with each other and both as part, un unexpected parts of processes of globalization. So thank you. Well, after such a wide-ranging and uh, stimulating talk, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of comments to make, and uh, we're going to ask Professor uh, Heck to just field the questions uh, directly. Professor Heck. How about you with this representation of forest types? The problem that you have is the area of the most massive clearing is sort of the uh, dry forest, semi-deciduous forest, and the Cerrado and Cerradão forests. Um, in, when the Constitution was rewritten in 1988, there was this whole deal about uh, national patrimony in which tropical forests had exactly this role that they would be conserved over specific portions and perhaps used to raise uh, animals in. But what happened is that the area, the most extensive area which had this expansion of the forest frontier was seen as be basically a forest deflection area. That is, you wanted to deflect development there away from the forest. And so that um, those legal strictures against um, uh, forest conservation or maintaining a certain proportion of your terrain out of production simply didn't apply. The other thing is if you sold the land, what you could do is you could keep your half of the land and then sell your forested part, and then that forested part could be, in areas where this law applied, the forested part could then be reduced by 10 percent. So there's a sort of strange process of diminution here. And actually, when you look at soybean landscapes, you really do not see a lot of um, forest maintenance in them. They're not that patchy. They are that sort of planar landscape. There are some, uh, what do you call them, um, wind breaks occasionally, but not as much as perhaps one might like. Yeah. Um, what do you think of the, I think there was a campaign spearheaded by Greenpeace, Greenpeace Brazil just recently, sort of pushed back the soybean landscape and pressure large carpet farmers. Uh, was that an appropriate area? That well, um, basically what they were going to try and do was to um, have British consumers not consume British, uh, Brazilian soybeans because it was pushing the deforestation frontier in two ways. One, by sort of taking over grasslands, uh, pasture lands, and turning them into soybean. And also, about 40% of them are direct deforestation. In Bolivia, it's all direct deforestation. Um, that would be fine, except that there's other act global actors in this, which is, of course, China, which is not re relatively <laughs> indifferent to um, these questions at this time. So. Um, it, it's, an, it, it's a very dicey question because since so much of Brazil's foreign exchange now is tied up in agricultural exports, it's very difficult to say, well, the soybean frontier shouldn't go forward. Um, and also it has the, the coterie of elites will not let that happen. So it's what, this is why perhaps agricultural zoning in those areas and sort of regulation of you know, more low-till farming more sort of uh, uh, production techniques that uh, in industrial farming that are less damaging is perhaps the strategy that you could advance there because it seems unlikely that you'll be able to do much else. Um, Bruno Magli, the head of um, Maggi uh, Group, is the largest soybean uh, producer in the world, I think. And he is the governor of Mato Grosso, so he's very unlikely to sort of shift his policy suddenly into, you know, a, a, a heartfelt conservation uh, strategy. So it's one of these things where there are, what, what, what's happening is really kind of a spatial uh, segmentation of this kind of thing, where I think in more humid zones what's going to happen is they're just not going to try, but where they can get it to go, they will, it, it sort of, limitless. And the technologies are both increasing the area under production and the 
uh, productivity of the land use. So it's intensifying and expanding at the same time. Yeah. Uh, on the graph of the percent of households that have remittances mm -hmm. versus land cleared, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I wonder, is it possible either that there's a threshold effect, or is that really a reflection of time, that it just takes longer to get up to that 35%? I think that it's probably both. I think that it's both a reflection of uh, the successional processes sort of take off. You need, certain er you need a certain amount of area that starts to regenerate. Um, and also, it, you know, we're looking at a very short period of time, too. We're looking at 12 years, so you're, I think what you see is uh, uh, both a, a function of the short period of time. But that regression is actually a pretty strong correlation. Um, yeah, I can, uh, I can send you the paper that has all the, the data in it. But we, um, we did a lot of ground truthing on this as well as uh, using, using a, a lot of census data that, that's come out, the 2000 and the 1996, to look at remittances. And remittances have been a big deal in this. Obviously, it's you know, a big part of the economy. So there's been a lot of studies on where it's going and how they're used. And the main thing is that in some places, you could imagine remittances being used to go into cattle ranching, for example. You could, I mean, that seems like in many ways one of the things that would happen. But what happens in this is that you just get a kind of retraction. The other thing is, as I mentioned actually when we were talking at lunch, I think another dynamic of this too is the feminization of the campo, the feminization of rural areas. As more men are migrating out, essentially you just have activities that tend to be more tree-based because they're not so labor demanding. You don't, doing a milpa in these places is a pain. There's also a fair amount of criminality, so your crops get stolen and so on. So there's a, a, there's a sort of shift away from doing field farming um, compared to what there had been in the past for a number of reasons. Yeah? You had a graph on the economy and natural resources. I was wondering what made up the natural resources. I mean, what were the subcategories? Oh, okay. Basically, I was using, using natural resources as a sort of term a, a natural resource base versus mineral or industrial or services. So I was using it as a big catch-all. So but you were but I mainly meant it. There, yeah. Than Tim. And other yeah. No, it's, it's basically uh, farming and uh, timber. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let me start with the Sierra Club argument first. Um, first, well, the problem if we look at global resources, and this is, you know, this is like this is like my, the, the cheap shot back, which is, you know, U.S. consumers are consume so much more than everybody else that um, the El Salvadorians who come here actually don't have the same consumption patterns as, you know, the the average suburban person living 
in a suburb in Los Angeles who drives 40 minutes a day in a large uh, SUV, you know, the, us the usual cliche set of cliches that are used to counter this. But one of the things that one might think about is the question of the forest transition more generally, which is that areas in the United States, for example, or in Europe, where agriculture became less competitive as other areas of agriculture became more dynamic, fell out of agriculture. And I, if you looked at the slide of El Salvador, and I can, I can whip us back um, so you can see it. Um, look at this, I'm just going exactly through history of time and everything. Let me get to that really beautiful three dimension. There we go. Um, what you have is an area where basically the forested areas along um, Well, they may have been the areas where corn was produced and domesticated, and uh, or many varieties of it were selected over human history. They may be, after all, this is part of the men, world of the men of maize. Um, there are areas where it's much more globally competitive to produce it, such as uh, the American Middle West, the plains of Russia, the pampas of Argentina and the southern flanks of the Amazon. So maybe one could look at this as perhaps a, an issue having to do more with a sort of global process of, of economic forces disciplining regions of production. So that's one way to go about it. The second thing, is, so we have the consumption, the American consumption model. We have the, um, the sort of economic model of efficiency driving forest transitions. But these areas are also quite densely populated. And that also what we need to look at is that in fact most of the population, population has maintained itself relatively steady there. It's urbanized and gone, inter gone internationally. But it's not clear to me that it is the um, um, uh, international migrants that are sort of uh, driving global, um, global processes of environmental degradation. And in fact, the counter argument could be made that um, unlike many people, their little paltry pennies go to support people that actually results in land uses and non-land uses that actually result in forest resurgence. So in a certain sense, maybe you should have more migrants sending more remittances back to have more forest resurgence, which would, and these, you know, these secondary forests suck up carbon really quickly. They are, um, they're, that's, they're at that rapid biomass accretion phase, not like mature forests that sort of sit and, you know, breathe and exhale, breathe and exhale. So there's that, there's that argument too, which is you could say maybe this is a better way. I mean, it, the Sierra Club argument really is more about racial categories rather than about uh, who's producing more environmental management. So that's, uh, you know, that's the other way to go with this question. The, the second issue, which is a really important one, and it's an issue that people raise all the time, is, well, what about the diversity characteristics? You don't, certainly can't be, you certainly don't want to tell me that, you know, this, these forests are as good as like some primeval forest. Well, in Central America, in any case, one, one of the things one has to understand is that these forests and their landscapes have been um, taken down and recuperated a lot. Part of that is just through the dynamics of the region itself. It's very, uh, it's very disaster, it's, what are we, mega, mega disaster, meta disasters? Uh, it's a very dynamic area that gets whapped around by hurricanes. It's an area of great volcanic vol activity. It's an area that undergoes a lot of earthquakes. You might recall the earthquake in 2000 that was just devastating. It was like a 7.5 or some astronomically high thing. I was just there last week and there was an earthquake in, in Guatemala. I mean, the, the place shakes all the time. It's also very vulnerable to El Nino effects, so there's drought in it as well. So what you have is a sort of shake and bake landscape 
um, where things are, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a disaster adapted landscape. So that in essence, it's got a lot of resilience built into it. And it is a place where both the natural uh, disturbance as well as human disturbance may be on a par with creating diversity. The other thing is that, um, and again I want to refer to Gretchen Daly's research in Costa Rica on countryside landscapes. What she shows is of course that many areas of these areas are not necessarily as diverse as old growth fragments, but that they're widely used by old growth species. So that actually if you want to think about diversity, you have to think about it as a, at, at the level of the landscape, not just at the, little, the level of comparing a pasture with a, with a forest, which is so often done, or a milpa with a forest. Uh, there have been a lot of stuff done with coffee and forest, which shows quite uh, interesting things. But what I think one wants to think about is if you look at the diversity um, of birds, of plants, uh, of uh, reptiles and mammals and stuff, for El Salvador, which is about the size of El, El, uh, LA County, it almost exceeds the diversity of the continental United States. So something about this landscape, well, part of it is it's, it's structurally diverse. It's got a lot of different climates. It's got a certain amount of endemism because it's a mountainous place. Um, and um, so, so that's contributing to it as well. But what I think you want to think about is that landscapes, both the domesticated, semi-domesticated, and wild landscapes really are interacting with each other. They're not sort of in boxes, you know, having nothing to do with each other. There's a lot of flow of animals and things around. So um, what I think one needs to think of is sort of meta-populations in landscapes and uh, thinking at a larger scale. Um, what you do see, what it's, I, I have a, 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 a table of this, but I didn't put it in, which is if you look at these things, you can really see that the diversity in this area, particularly avian diversity, is astonishingly high, considering how small it is. Well, it's interacting with lots of different things, including the United States. Yeah? I have some of the data on forest cover from satellite. Yes, it does. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's what you call forest. I mean, we, when, when we write about it, we call it woody vegetation or woodlands. Um, and, but if you are in it, it looks like you're in a forest. It may be a coffee forest. It may be a degraded pasture. It may be an agro-silvo pastoral system. But it is, um, you know, people get all upset when it depends. This has to do with the problem of what you call a forest. So. Actually, most of the time in um, a lot of the things we write, uh, we refer to it as woody vegetation, just to sort of calm, calm the jets of... of Is there a great definition or definition? Well, what we do is simply say, you know, we look at woody cover at, you know, 30%, 60%. You know, it's, it's the average cover of a pixel. So we work, we work it from the pixel. But what is a forest? Um, you know, it's a, it's a construct, it's a, it's a, it's something that exists in the world. It also is a symbol and it's also an idea and it's also a cultural construct. So if you were to go into uh, a coffee forest, um, many conservation biologists would not say that that's really a forest. They would say it's an agroforestry, it's an agricultural system and that a forest is only this. So what I'm arguing in this is that actually there are these matrix kinds of forests, these woody, veg these woody la wooded landscapes that for various reasons, because they're anthropogenic, and because of the sort of legacy about how forests, what a forest is, i.e. a true forest has no people in it, rather than these you know, diverse ag agroforests managed by women, you know, um, that those may, those, their diversity indices may be every bit as high as uh, some of your, you know, tropical dry forests, for example. So 
the question is that the idea of a forest is a social concept. And it seems to me that we need to include in the 21st century uh, an approach to forests that includes stuff that isn't just an a forest primeval, an imagined forest that has been uh, sort of set up as, a, as an ideal. Just to, just to take a, um, a um, just to be really nasty about this, I'll, and I shouldn't, I, have, I work a lot with conservation organizations. I fight them face to face all the time about this exact question. In another project I'm work, working on is the biography of Euclides da Cunha and the sort of forest, the boundary study of the Purus River. If you go on, if you tap into Google Purus, you'll get from Duke University a whole thing about how the Purus is the last wild place on earth, how it's got the last sort of nomadic, most, you know, the Stone Age tribe that runs from man, the whole thing. And um, what's so interesting about it, in fact, I'm going to do a study with one of the ecologists from this team, is that actually Euclides da Cunha goes through it in 1904 and 1905, and he's sitting there, and Every place is occupied. Everything has a place name. He's got the coordinates of everything because he was doing this as a boundary survey. So it's, it's noted and it's thoroughly populated. So one of the things is sort of taking something that was thoroughly populated and imagining it as, as never having had a human history. And that actually happens quite a bit, in the, at least in the New World tropics and I imagine elsewhere. But there, this is... Certainly, Central America, with its long history of Mayan and Olmec occupation, essentially what you're seeing is sort of successional forests of different types. But it's a good question, and I'm rambling because it's... Oh, oh are we done? Ooh. Okay. Okay, how about you? Actually, they're pretty documented. They're not like the men. They, they tended to be, they tended to go in legally. But anyway. Uh, well, anyway, we can have a discussion about that. Okay. Uh, without uh, generating a reversal of this forest recovery? It's an interesting question, and it really, you know, it's sort of the key question, which is, this is a really un relatively unstable configuration, and so everyone is sort of going, how do you get this more stable? Um, certainly under the neoliberal regime, basically the sort of safety, instead of having a social safety net and investing in social services, the Salvadoran state has chosen not to do that. There are no income taxes, for example, in, in El Salvador. So um, even though it, it's actually quite, has a, a, a wealthy elite. Um, so you're absolutely right to say what would be the kinds of condition that would permit Salvadorians to stay there and reproduce themselves in that, in that context. Um, you, under the neoliberal regime, I don't think you would see that. Uh, because essentially the Salvadorian elite says the safety net is a sort of self-produced safety net. So go and migrate. The way that these peasant households will get their security is not through claims on the state, which is how it had been historically made, um, but rather through claims on kinship. And that's how social security and economic 
social services will be provided. Um, that is, you want, you want medical care, you can pay for it. Uh, have, just send somebody else into the migrant circuit. So in order for that question to be, to be transformed, you have to have a lot of structural change in the economy in a di different direction. The end of the sort of authoritarian period was characterized by a lot of corruption and so on and so forth everywhere. Um, not that this current one isn't, but um, it was very effective at de 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 uh, dismantling state institutions of social services. So under this particular model, the Salvadorian development model is one that depends on social, for social reproduction and social security on a model that includes a migrating, a migrating proportion of its population. So if you stop that migration, the larger question about what happens with these areas still remains up for grabs. What you see is when you can't get migration, you get a lot of criminality because there isn't that much dyna dynamism within the economy. So you have sort of banditry that seems to emerge as one of the main roots of accumulation. But it's a sort of problematic moment actually in terms of what many people in Central America see as a sort of real major shift in the models of accumulation in Central America and South America. Thank you again for a, a stimulating day. Okay. There we go.